want to talk a little bit this morning about baptism throughout the Bible. There's some connections to make throughout the Bible. So maybe a little bit more of a doctrinal kind of message this morning. But I hope you have a Bible. If you don't, you're in trouble uh, because we're going through a lot of scripture this morning. So I'm not where my guys are, but if you need a Bible, raise your hand uh, and we'll get a Bible passed out to you. And when you get that Bible, uh, probably the first verse for you to go to is going to be Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. So if you need a Bible do that. Let me, let me say this about baptism before I get started. This is a huge topic, and there's no way I can cover what all the Bible has to say about baptism in one lesson. There's just too much territory. Uh, but since we're going to be doing water baptism next week, I, I wanted to be able to talk about it because I believe that many of us in this room need to be baptized next week. I'm just going to say that bluntly and boldly, and I'll present my case as we go through today. The Bible talks about really three Three different kinds of baptism uh, for the people, and, and maybe I would call it three and a half, and that might make sense in a minute. But I'm going to start out with where it's at starting in the New Testament. In the New Testament, in Mark 1 4, John the Baptist or John the Baptizer is going through the countryside and he's baptizing people. In Mark 1 4, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, again, in Acts 19.4, Paul says this about John. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is Jesus. So what is John doing? He's preaching a baptism of repentance, but it's for the fact of believing in Jesus who is about to come onto uh, the scene. Uh, so was it a baptism of forgiveness? No, it was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, and, and that being shown in baptism. Now that's going to make a little more sense later, but if you haven't understood John's baptism for repentance, I hope to make that clear this morning. See, in John's time, Jesus had not come and gone through his ministry, had not died on the cross, had not been resurrected, so there wasn't a baptism in Jesus to replicate or to dramatize, to spiritually follow what Jesus had done in his death and resurrection. So what John says is, I'm giving giving you a baptism of repentance. Now, if you look at repentance in Scripture, repentance is always referring to changing your mind toward what Jesus had done on the cross. Uh, when Peter gave that great sermon, that first one in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, he was telling them, repent. You have to recognize that this Jesus died and was resurrected for you. So when John was doing a baptism of repentance, he was saying, you guys need to know about repentance, what Christ did done for you and this act is going to symbolize that so I'm getting you ready for that so that baptism was a picture of repentance for forgiveness but it resembled what was going to happen with Jesus and I'm going to show you that in Romans 6 Romans 6 1 if you got it say I got it if you don't say wait all right here we go what shall we say then are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, we've been baptized into his death. We get baptized into his death. What was his death? His death was a payment for us, for our sin, and then a resurrection for eternal life. But he let go of the flesh. He let go of the physical body in his death. 
Verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. In other words, if we die to the flesh as he did, we can live a new life. Are you seeing that? Christ dies to the flesh. He gives up his fleshly body and he is raised to walk a new life. For if we become united with him in the likeness, hear me out, we're becoming in the likeness of his death, not in actual death, but doing something that's in the likeness, being baptized, being laid down under the water, then certainly we shall be in his likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. Amen. So here's what he's saying. The believer that dies physically enters a world. The believer that dies physically enters the eternal world where there is no sin. So he's saying that when we die, there's a spiritual walk that we take from this physical life into that spiritual one. And the one who dies spiritually in baptism enters a new life in the kingdom of God. We're replicating that death and resurrection that Jesus did where he died to his flesh and was raised to his eternal life. We are dying to the flesh in baptism and being raised into a spiritual new life. So like Jesus put away his mortal body to take on his eternal body, we die to an old life of the flesh and we take on a life in the spirit. But it's not the baptism that saves you. It's the crucifixion and the resurrection that we're dramatizing or that we're reenacting in the spiritual walk of baptism. It's saying that we're going to go through what Jesus went in a spiritual sense. We're going to die to the old life, to the flesh, to the things of the flesh. Not physically, but the things of this world and the flesh. And we're going to raise to walk a new life, a new spiritual life. So Jesus left his fleshly body in death and took on his glorified body in resurrection. And we're going to do that in a spiritual sense. Now, if that's not clicking with you yet... Let me show you how scripturally it's explained to us out of the old covenant. Under the old covenant, God said, I want you to be circumcised, man. I want you to be circumcised. It's in Genesis 17, 10 through 11. So there is a connection between circumcision in the old covenant and baptism in the new covenant. In Genesis 17, 10, it says, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you. This is God talking to Abraham. And your descendants after you, every male among you that is circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign. Everybody say a sign. Yeah. Circumcision shall be a sign of the covenant between God and man, between me and you. So God tells Abraham, I want you to be circumcised. And watch this. I want you to take off the flesh as a covenant sign that you and I are in covenant. So you're going to remove the flesh and we're going to be in covenant. And the removal of that flesh will be a sign that we're in covenant. So I don't know if you see it, but in the old covenant, you have a physical covenant in the flesh... And then baptism is a circumcision of the flesh, of the old, the spiritual flesh. So we're talking always in the Old Testament about the real, the tangible, the physical, so we can understand the spiritual concepts in the new covenant. So the old covenant was, I want the old flesh taken off so you show that you're in covenant with me. And in the new covenant, I want you to spiritually die and let the old flesh go so that you show you're in covenant with me. So baptism is a spiritual sign of a covenant relationship with God. If it hadn't clicked yet, stay with me. If you'll notice in, in the old covenant, circumcision did not remove their sins. They were not right with God because they were circumcised. They were right with God because they conducted the sacrifices for atonement of their sin. 
So the sacrifice is what gave them atonement of their sins for God, but circumcision was a sign that they were in relationship with God. So if circumcision didn't save them, it identified them as being in covenant with God, but they still had to have the sacrifices to atone their relationship. Are you seeing that? I know we're going kind of deep, but just stay with me. So baptism doesn't save us. It identifies us as being in covenant relationship with Christ. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is what removes our sin and gives us atonement to God. Stay with me. So let me show you how that's explained by Paul in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, 2 verse 9. You guys are just looking like, what? <laughs> You're going to love this when we're done because it's going to make a lot of sense. So in Colossians 2, Paul begins to explain what I just explained to you. So let's hear him explain it. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He's talking about Jesus has all of the deity of, Christ, of God in a bodily form. And in him, Jesus, you've been made complete. And he, Jesus, is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, now watch, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands... In the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision that Christ did without hands, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith. You were not raised to walk a newness of life because of baptism. You were raised to walk because of faith. But the removal of the body of the flesh of the old life of the sinful life in baptism... When you were dead in your trespasses, transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He's saying you got baptized when you were in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. And what he's saying is, like in Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but we've been made alive in Christ. He made you alive together with him. So we're identified through a spiritual circumcision that's not made with hands called baptism. Having forgiven us of all of our transgression, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. He's talking about the law, which was hostile to us. He is taking it out of the way. How? How has it been taken out of the way? Having nailed it to the cross. Always goes back to the cross for forgiveness, but baptism is the relationship in covenant with Christ. So I'm going to read that whole thing again so you can hear it without my, um, without my words in the middle. For in him all of the fullness of deity dwells in a bodily form. And in him you've been made complete. He's the head and the rule of all authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision that wasn't made with hands in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been baptized with him, in, you know, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, which is hostile to us. He's taken it away, having nailed it to the cross. So you see, there's a connection between circumcision and baptism. Circumcision was the physical picture of the removal of the flesh, not salvation, because that came through sacrifice. And baptism is the physical picture of the removal of my old life, my old life in sin, my fleshly life. So there's the connection between John's baptism, who is looking forward to that repentance, and the baptism of Jesus, which is a spiritual symbol of putting off the old man and being identified as in covenant with Christ. That connection is Jesus. I say it like this. Baptism can be much uh, parallel to a wedding ring. The wedding ring I wear does not make me married to my wife. What made me married to my wife is the covenantial commitment I made before God to her. But I wear this wedding ring to tell you I'm in covenant relationship with her. Baptism does the same thing. It did not make you saved. What it did was tell everyone you're in covenant relationship with Christ. Are you seeing that? 
Good, good. So we have a circumcision. It's the baptism of repentance. And then there's a water baptism in Christ. Now there's another baptism that's listed in the Bible. So we had circumcision originally, which showed us that the flesh had to be removed. Then we had the baptism of repentance that said, get ready. There's a need for the Savior and what he did for you coming. So be baptized in repentance. And then Christ came and said, no, that one that John talked about is now here. I have died. Now if you want to be in covenant relationship with me, I will sacrifice myself for you to take care of your sins. You will be baptized to show that you're in covenant relationship with me. Then there's another baptism listed in scripture. It's called the baptism of the Spirit. Now, we talked about the baptism of the Spirit just a couple weeks ago. Uh, John the Baptist said it this way. He knew it was coming. In Matthew 3, 11, he said, As for me, I baptize with water for repentance, to give you that picture of Christ and his coming. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we know that John baptized with water and he said that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. So is that doing away with water baptism because now Jesus is baptizing in the Spirit? Good. I just made a few people nervous. I thought, where is he going to go with that? But watch this. In the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he sends them out to baptize, right? So we know we have the command to baptize. But the question now is, is that water baptism or is that Holy Spirit baptism? You have to go back to Colossians. In Colossians, it said baptism was a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection that shows that we're in covenant with Christ. So if we don't go through that process of death, burial, and resurrection in the water, we're not putting on the wedding ring. We're not showing that we're in covenant relation with Christ. So the disciples of Jesus continued to baptize in water. Uh, we know that because they were continuing to show you are now identified with Christ. You need to be baptized. But listen, watch this. There's a connection between water baptism, the death, the burial, and resurrection, that dramatization, that reenactment, that putting off of the old fleshly world and coming up into the new spiritual walk in the kingdom, and the spirit baptism. There's actually a connection between those two. Watch this in Acts 19. Acts chapter 19. Here's what happens. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul passed through the upper country and he came to Ephesus. And he found some disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Christ. That's the definition of the word. So this is believers that he found. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now that's some preaching somebody did to them. We didn't even know a Holy Spirit existed. And he said, now watch this, into what then were you baptized? Now, is that not an interesting question? You don't have the Holy Spirit working in your life? Well, then what were you baptized into? Because if you're baptized into Christ, you should have the Holy Spirit working in your life. So he asked the question, what then were you baptized? And they said into John's baptism, the one for repentance that we're supposed to believe in Jesus who's coming. And Paul said, well, well John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now watch. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now what do we know about the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon someone? They began speaking in tongues and prophesying. This is the baptism of the Spirit. If you want to know more about the baptism of the Spirit, on our website about four or five weeks ago, there's a message called Pentecost. Go watch that message. It will explain the scriptural foundation of the baptism of the Spirit. But Paul said, the Holy Spirit didn't come upon you. Wait a minute. Something must be off in your baptism. So you were baptized with John? No, no, no. You need to be in covenant relationship with Christ and then the baptism of the Spirit can happen. So you need this picture to show you're identified with Christ. And then the Holy Spirit baptism can come. 
So as you'll learn from that Pentecost message, back in John chapter 20, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He's come back. His crucifixion is complete. His resurrection is complete. He meets with the disciples and he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now you have the Holy Spirit. Then he gives them the instruction. Now wait in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes upon you with power. So they already had the Holy Spirit, but he tells them to wait until it comes upon them with power. So what's happening here is these guys have been saved, they're disciples, they get water baptized, and then John brings the, or Paul brings the baptism of the Spirit into the fact. Now, now let me show you. He, let's go to another chapter. Maybe this will help. Acts 10. Go to Acts 10. I'll show you another instance where water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism are together. Acts 10 verse 39. We are witnesses of all things he did both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem. Now what's happening here is Peter has been called by a vision to go meet with a Roman Gentile named Cornelius. He's seen this vision of this food coming, or these animals coming down, and God telling him to eat, and he says, I can't, that's unclean food. And God says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. At the same time, Cornelius has had a vision that this man is supposed to come and speak to him named Peter, so he sends people to go get Peter, and now they've met. And Peter is telling Cornelius the story of what happened to Jesus. We're witnesses of the things that he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, Peter says. They also put him to death by hanging him on the cross and God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. What did Peter just give him? The gospel of salvation. He just said he's been crucified and he's been risen from the dead. Not to all people did he become a witness, but to those who were chosen before God. That is those who ate and drank after him after he arose from the dead. Ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. That's when Jesus meets with the disciples. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who's been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all of the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Everyone who believes in Christ, his death, his resurrection, receives forgiveness of sin. Now look at 44. While Peter is still speaking these words, what words? That belief in his death and his burial and his resurrection brings forgiveness of sins. The Holy Spirit fell upon, everybody say upon. The Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because that gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. What just happened? Peter just shared the gospel with them about believing in Christ will bring forgiveness of your sins. And the Holy Spirit baptizes them right there. But I want you to watch what Peter does because Peter understands there's a missing component. In 46... For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, watch this. Surely no one can refuse the water to these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Talking about on the day of Pentecost. It came upon them and they began to prophesy and they began to speak in tongues. He said, surely no one can deny the water so that we can do them. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to stay on for days. So here's the picture. They came to know, they believed, then the Holy Spirit baptized them. Peter said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not right. They need to be water baptized if they're going to be baptized in the Spirit. So can anybody refuse water so that we can go get these people water baptized? So water baptism is still a part of this process. It's the spiritual act of putting off the old flesh and stepping into the spiritual kingdom of God. It's a sign that we're in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And I could even argue that it may be a predecessor step to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why do I say that? Because before they had believed and they got baptized in Jesus' name and then they got baptized in the Spirit. Here they believed, they got baptized in the Spirit. Peter said, wait a minute, something's out of order. We need to find some water. We got to baptize these guys in water. Mm. Okay. 
So next week, we're talking about doing water baptism. And so what I'm doing is encouraging you to consider where you are in the process of needing to be in covenant relationship with Christ through water baptism. I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about that symbol of dying to the old life that you had of the flesh and of sin and walking into the kingdom of God with a covenant marker called baptism. We believe that a person has to believe in order to be in a covenant relationship. I have to understand that God is saying he wants my old life of the flesh taken off. I need to die with Jesus. I need to be raised like Jesus was raised out of that death. And I need to walk in this new life. I don't believe a baby can do that. Some of us were baptized as babies. Now hear me out. Because theologically there's something that makes sense. There's just a gap in it. Circumcision was done at eight years old. Circumcision was done as a covenant with God. So now many churches will baptize babies as saying the baby is in covenant relationship with God. The problem with that is that circumcision back then did not save a child. It just showed a covenant relationship with God. The women obviously were not circumcised. When we come to the New Testament and we look at the spiritual concept that we're supposed to learn from the physical, the question is, when can I come in covenant relationship with God? It's when I'm dead, buried, and raised with Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. Are you seeing that? So we baptize adults who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and want to be in that covenant relationship, the ones who want to put the wedding ring on. Uh, in Acts 8.35, Philip is speaking to a man uh, who is a eunuch who is traveling. He's been reading the scripture. He can't understand the scripture. And it says, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture they're reading from, he preached Jesus to them. Now that's awesome because Philip only has the Old Testament, and he preaches Jesus through the Old Testament. As they went along on the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized, coming into covenant relationship with Jesus Christ? And Peter said, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. Otherwise, you're just getting wet. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water. And Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. He gave him that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, the symbol of that. And it's a pretty easy thing to do when you think about it. Uh, we have this beautiful picture of Christ dying being put into a grave or a tomb, and then raising out of that. And in the same way, we have water baptism where we fall back into the death, we are buried in the water, and we get raised out of the water. And it's the symbolism. Now, here's the beauty of it. Christ didn't ask you to die. He asked you to be baptized, to go through the symbol of what I went through, to get rid of the old flesh and walk in a new life. There's a man named Naaman in Scripture in the Old Testament who had leprosy. Uh, and he went to the prophet and he said, I want this leprosy removed from me. And the prophet said, okay, go down to the river and dip in it seven times. And Naaman says, that's not good enough for me. I just want you to come here. I want you to wave your hand over me. Don't make me walk down to the river. And his servants say, are you kidding me? If he'd asked you to do something incredible to get rid of your leprosy, you'd have done it. But if he just asked you to go dip in the water, you won't do it. So Naaman goes. And he dips in the water seven times. And he comes out clean of his leprosy. My point is, if you have not been water baptized, what are you waiting for? It's not a difficult thing. It's not a complicated thing. It's like slipping on the wedding ring. It's saying, I'm in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. See, I think there are four groups of people in here. And maybe you can figure out which one of these four categories you fall into. There are people in here who believed in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and the saving atonement of that, and then they got baptized in water. See, at eight years old, I went down an aisle in a church because the man said, if you don't get baptized, you're going to hell. So I went down to get baptized. I had no idea what Jesus had done for me. I just didn't want to go to hell. 
And so at 20 years old, when I figured out there was an atonement, a price paid for my sin, that Jesus did that, and he was asking me to be in covenant relationship with him through water baptism, and that he would save my life, I went down, at, literally at 10 o'clock at night, I knocked on my pastor's door, and I said, you got to get up, you got to take me down to church, I'm going to be baptized right now. Because I didn't want to wait until the next Sunday morning. I was ready to do it right now. And so at 20, I got baptized knowing that I was putting on the covenant relationship with Jesus Christ and that he had saved me. There's another group in here that's never believed. Never believed in this Jesus Christ thing. Maybe checking it out, maybe not understanding it. I'm going to address you guys in just a minute. Then there's a group in here that's unique. You believe in what Christ has done for you. You believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection for you. But you've never been water baptized. It's been that thing that, well, Wayne, maybe one day I'll do it. Who knows? Or, you know, it's not that, it doesn't matter about my salvation, so why should I? Listen, it matters. Let me tell you why it matters. Because if you're not being baptized to show that you're in covenant relationship with Christ, you're being disobedient. And so then maybe it hinders your baptism in the spirit. Maybe it hinders some of the blessings that God wants to pour out on you. Because right now, those who would profess him in front of others, Jesus would profess before the Father. And then finally, there's people here who got baptized, but it was before you believed. That was me. I got baptized at 8. And, and didn't believe at the time. And then I got baptized because I did believe. Uh, maybe you were baptized as a child. And they said, don't worry about it. That's all good. Here's what I'm saying. I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm questioning whether or not you took on the covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you were not water baptized. And that's the symbol we have for taking on the covenant relationship with Christ. Of stepping out of that. Oh, that's why when we baptize. We say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk a new life. Because we're putting off that old life of the flesh and we're taking on that new spiritual walk with him. Thank you so much for joining us today on Revive Us Now. I hope that the word today has been beneficial to you. I hope that the Holy Spirit would just plant it in your heart and you could see the changes come about in your life. If you'd like to know more about Revive Church, join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come and see us in one of our services on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart. Thank you again for being with us. God bless you and have a great day.